Thomas B. Stanford, who was he? The tragedy of the Negro in America. Oh, yeah. He was the ambassador from England to record um, all the lynchings that were going on in the South. Correct. And what was uh, his intention? What was the objective of documenting these? It wasn't just lynchings. It was, in general, any injustices. Right. Right. What was he doing with this catalog of experiences of African Americans? who were at this point free people, right? We're talking it. about 1890s. He was publishing it. That was way, the way of getting the information out there. And mm -hmm. that was his form of social media at the time. So mm -hmm. the world was aware of what was going on within the US. Okay. I was gonna ask, was this what we read on, third, um, on Tuesday, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So we read, we read just a couple of cases of lynchings that are in that um, catalog that he put together. It's a book. The, the uh, tragedy of the Negro in America. He also actually goes into more detail, uh, highlighting the various different kinds of uh, injustices that African Americans experience. You know, uh, from enslavement all the way through uh, migration, and even made some some uh, projections of what he thought. American society should be like, okay? So this is just a snippet that I, I pulled out to give you uh, a sense of what, how he described the lynchings. Lynchings, uh, so now we're talking about after 1865, right? End of Civil War through the 1940s. Were those covered in newspapers? Were those yes, covered yes. in newspapers? Yes, right? They definitely were, um, not to, an extensive uh, extent, you know, not, not in, not really reflecting the frequency with which they were happening, or the extent to which they, they uh, occupied and facilitated this sense of white supremacy. But they were co they were covered in the media, just usually like a paragraph, you know, this happened in, in this part of town. Uh, it was attended by so many people, but just very small descriptions, usually. Yes. I want to ask you a question. So it was a picture inside the lynching paragraph, and it was like a picture of like a banner that says a man was lynched today. Did they really do that? Or is that what you Does that picture? picture look real to you? It looks real, but I'm just saying it is real. That, it is real, and there were over 4,000 such lynchings recorded. There's actually. EJI, uh, Equal Justice Initiative, which put together this lynching in America report, documented 600 more cases. That's why we are at about 4,000 plus. And I've already told you, not all of the lynchings or anything, or <coughs> acts of more violence that qualify as lynchings were actually recorded in some publication or the other. Those 4,000 are just those that could be in one way or the other, uh, trace back to some some publication, okay? Uh, but we know that there were more than that. Many would not be considered newsworthy uh, because there was. it's not as if they were trying to publicize or society was trying to publicize these kinds of uh, uh, acts, right? It was, on, it was trying to be, it, these were acts which were in response to allegations that you know some African American had either raped somebody, had committed a certain crime, but these were not legally sanctioned acts, right? Because sometimes you would see that uh, the those that were lynched were pulled out of of yeah. out of jail, out of courthouses. Sometimes the lynchings happened right in the courthouse law. Okay. So these were not legally sanctioned, but e effectively, uh, the society, the, the state looked the other way. The local municipalities looked the other way, right? So I'm going to I'm giving you these these uh, this assignment to do at home because I want you to spend more time and um, give me something that's well thought out. Okay, all of. The answers, or most of the answers, can be traced back to either what you read on the Negro, in the tragedy of the Negro in America, or 
the, the actual report itself, lynching in America, okay? I'm going to be grading relatively um, uh, ha uh, harshly because I'm giving you more time. You should have done it in class. But let's discuss some of those points a bit. You can actually take notes on your, on your questionnaire uh, because you can download the, the, the question again and, and print it and start fresh, okay? Yeah. Good question. So Thomas P. Stanford, the pastor who came all the way from Birmingham, England to document uh, the experience of African Americans in the 1890s, he wrote that book, The Negro, The Tragedy of the Negro in America, in a uh, sort of a personal account and the intention the end motive of him putting all of that together was to shame America from white from uh, white supremacy basically right he was trying to put in vivid detail uh, what the life of African Americans has been like since the end of slavery uh, in, in particular right so it was an attempt to bring experiences that for the most part were hidden and buried under <laughs> underground of American society into the fore, right? You could take that book, read anything from the lives of, of slaves all the way through uh, the kinds of um, terror, domestic terror, lynchings that caused millions and millions of blacks to, to migrate uh, up north and also to the west. Okay, so I'm asking you for this small essay to put yourselves in his words and his voice and simply just write an, an essay which, which uh, explores what lynching was, uh, the effect of lynching on black families. Uh, think about, think about the, the racial uh, animus that is created when a family is is lynched, or the father, the, 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 the man in a household, black, the black man in a household is lynched. Think about what happens, how, how that, portray that in Thomas P. Stanford's words, as though he was trying to raise a certain level of uh, enlightenment in American society, okay? It's, the time period is not so necessary. American society, we know that needs to examine and explore and learn about issues like lynching because without really accounting and and acknowledging what happened in the past it's hard to to sit down together and talk about we are a nation that is post-racial right and we're not yes mine it's not a persuasive or argumentative essay it's just like an informative one it could be inf informative it's yes. Don't yeah. it, uh, we're not really arguing. We're just informing you of something that you're, you're informing. But remember the the actual the final motive mot motivations for uh, of Stanford in putting this together. His final intention was that it should help yes inform society about what what the African American experience has been like, but also to shame them away from engaging in white supremacist uh, thoughts and manifestations, right? Institutional racism, right? So it's in that sense, it's, it's also persuasive. Your, your conclusion of your essay should basically persuade American societies to acknowledge all of what's happened and that there needs to be a, a sort of a reconciliation for African Americans in society. I gave you up to two pages. I'm not asking for a, an in-depth, yeah. uh, long <laughs> paper. Just, just uh, follow the guidelines and address all of those issues that are raised in the bullet points. Uh, before, let's just keep going. Karen, would you please uh, read for us the first bullet point? I'm sorry, Karen. <coughs> Let's go back a bit, because we're not going to cover this in class. Thomas P. Stanford was coming from where? England, right? When did 
let's talk about England a bit because slavery we know happened there as well, right? But slavery is not something when you when you talk about slavery or when you watch uh, films or documentaries on slavery, you typically don't think of uh, or hear about England first, right? You hear about the United States of America or colonial North America or the Caribbean, right? You, some of you have watched Amistad, um, the transatlantic voyages, but you don't typically hear about England. Why is that? Yes. Um, England was the first to abolish slavery? They were the first to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. And yes, they did ab abolish slavery before the United States, right? But there's another reason why, yes. I think they enslaved their own people. Is that How do you mean? Like, it wasn't so much racial as it was more like class-based in England. I had learned mm -hmm. something about that. Like they didn't like, base, like in the United States, it was, you know, the white people, the black people, but in England, they just enslaved people who were like poor. They didn't really face it off with like your color. That may people. have been, right, thank you. That may have been before slaves were, before the transatlantic slave trade, yes. Okay. They had various uh, stratifications within their society so that some were of lower caste. But England definitely participated in the slave trade and they did import uh, slaves as well. In fact, they were the most uh, prolific slave exporting nation. They, they, <laughs> they revolutionized the extent to which the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade was being conducted, right? Because they had a very established maritime or navy, uh, navy operations and bigger ships, right? They actually exported more slaves from Africa than, than anybody once they got in uh, in the late 17th and 18th centuries, right? But there's another reason, which is, does anyone else raise their hands here? Think about where, think about, okay, I'll have you answer this question, um, Dana. I was gonna guess that they weren't as harsh in England as, like, as, or as cruel there's, as they were in America. I think you're getting at it, but why is that? Where was the slavery, uh, where was, were the British exporting slaves? Or even the Dutch or the Portuguese before that? Yeah, where? Where? Well, I mean, they were most, mostly within America and the, um, and the islands. Thank you, and yeah, the so, Caribbean. Right. Right? Right. Um, so it wasn't so much England. Right. They, they, because even in Virginia, they, mm -hmm. they had slaves in like Virginia and mm -hmm. places like that. So, but, but, um, I mean, I guess they lost their, their foothold in, 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 in slavery to the Dutch and, um, you know, the Europeans eventually, so. But you, you're on the right point. The point of what we should really note about the difference in how African Americans are treated in this country, or the, the issue of race here and the issue of race in England is that was was largely because in England, they were ex mostly exporting black slaves to plantations in the Caribbean. It was not a situation where they were bringing them into England. Oh yes, of course, there were aristocratic families in England who, who uh, loved to have a, a, a black slave within their household, right? It was a thing of status. But slaves were not brought into England in the quantities that were brought into colonial North America or into the Caribbean, right? The, the, I mean, think about England. The, the environment was not conducive to plantations, right? Or to growing the kinds of things for which you would need intensive human labor, right? The 800,000 or so documented slaves that belonged to the thousands of, of British families were in the Caribbean, right? So in that sense, it was so easy for uh, British historians, and even the wills, the wills of these aristocratic families or, or white slave owners in, in Britain to leave the properties in the Caribbean as footnotes, right? They didn't really have to go delve deep 
into expressing in manuscripts like wills uh, the extent to which they engaged in slave trade. That was something that was happening in the Caribbean. But yes, they were, they owned those slaves. In fact, there were some, there was quite a market for slave loaning in, in the Caribbean. You didn't even have to, as a white family who owned slaves in England, you didn't have to directly be in charge of, of managing your, your property, your chattel. You, you, you could just lease them out to, you've heard of those gang, uh, gang slave laboring operations, right? You could lease them to slavers in the Caribbean who would pay you a certain fee to rent your human chattel, right? So in that sense, it's not, the British have had an easier time in actually whitewashing the extent to which they engaged in, in slavery. Uh, that's a fact. However, and this is something that you can take a look at in your own time, recently there were a group of uh, historians, I forget their names, who, who went and dug up uh, the, uh, the uh, Slavery Compensation Act uh, records, which detailed in extent, in pretty good detail, uh, the 46,000 or so British families that engaged in slavery. It told you everything from how many slaves they had, where those slaves were, were actually based in the Caribbean, the, the conditions, who was actually managing them. They actually had to, to do that because unlike America, when slavery ended in, the Brit, in, Brit, in England, uh, the government actually compensated f uh, white uh, slave-owning families, right? They actually compensated them with taxpayers' money. And everybody who was a slave owner m had to make sure that they were on those uh, documents so that they received their due. And th those are the, the manuscripts from those Slavery Compensation Act which have given us a very detailed accounting as to uh, the involvement of British in, in the slave, in the slavery of those times. I just thought we're not going to be discussing that in this class, but you should be aware of that. So yes. When, so it was abolished in England. The government reimbursed people who owned the slaves. That's right. Mm -hmm. It was a huge, huge compensation. If I'm not mistaken, it was twenty million pounds. Back then, that was like sixteen, seventeen billion pounds. Today. Um, I'm not good in actually, I can remember the numbers, but I'm not good in converting, but you guys know that a pound is greater than a US dollar, right? Yes, yeah, so um, yeah, they all got their cut based on the, the number of slaves. And this is an accommodation that the British government had to, or let's say the abolitionists in, in England had to agree to, to bring slavery to an end in, in, in Britain. It's a, it's, it's a it was a compromise, if you will. It's, that's not to say, just like we saw here, that once slavery ended in 1833 in England, that that was it. Uh, slaves were, were free. Slaves were actually required to pay part of those uh, for their freedom. They, they, in many instances, they had to work for 45 years. I'm sorry, for about two decades, for 45 hours a week even though they had been set free, okay? But we're not going to go into too much detail. That was what was happening in the England that uh, Mr. Stanford left to come here and, and try and um, make things better for African Americans. Karen, I was asking you to read the bullet point number one, which you should explore in your papers over the weekend. Why American society must be educated on the history of Okay, so somebody tell me. We discussed it in class last week. Yes, Dana. Um, to shame people into not letting us To shame, um, to learn from the past? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, if you, in, there's, there's more that can help you to answer that in your reading, okay? But that's the basic point. Yes, Samir and then Maya. I think you should have looked at uh, uh, as covered as it should have been in the education system. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same point. It's it's absolutely it's been entirely whitewashed uh, in most people's um, experience as high schoolers or even before. I don't even expect you to have covered Ameri uh, black history as much 
in, in, uh, in your elementary uh, <laughs> educational careers. But in high school, most of you didn't cover uh, lynching, what, uh, much less black history, okay? Yes, Maya. Can you also use uh, an outside source just to cite it or something that you know? You can. You can certainly use out other sources to inform your answers. That's that's completely fine. Okay. <coughs> yes. Would I be able Andrea? To... No. And something. No. James. Uh, what's Jody? it? J Jody. Yeah. Jody. Sorry. Real close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. You guys are so kind. <laughs> um, would I be able to talk about like how? Um, not necessarily that like some forms of lynching are going on today, but how um, the way that blacks are still treated today, could mm -hmm. I talk about that? Absolutely. Uh, read the second bullet point where you may, you may find a more fitting place to, to do that. How lynching was used to reinforce the legacy of white supremacy and illustrate the implications on the criminal justice system. Okay, everybody got that? Yeah. That might be a wonderful place, a part within your essay to, to, to talk about that. Okay? Yes. How about on the page? One to two pages. Okay. Uh, what did she say again? For the second one? Would you tell us again your response? What, you, mean, you were going somewhere with your response, yes which I thought would be suitable in, to answer that second bullet point. Oh yeah, I was talking about how people are treated today related to lynching in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are manifestations in present day society which, which can remind you of those kinds of practices, of domestic terror practices like lynching, right? Like police brutality. Uh, you'll find that the criminal justice system especially is one that those legacies can be uh, more vividly seen, right? Imadi, would you read bullet point number three? Yeah, the screaming effects of terror lynchings on black society and why those particular acts are not to be confused with hate crimes. Okay, Lanoi, would you, would you try and answer that? Okay. Please read that question again, Imadi. Explain the effects of terror lynches on black society and why those particular acts are not to be confused with hate crimes. Mm -hmm. What's different? Think about it. What's different between lynchings, terror lynchings, and hate crimes as it's, as it's persecuted today? The lynchings weren't necessarily prosecuted. Right. Was there any, thank you, Christian, was there any person that committed lynching that was held accountable mm -hmm. that we know of? No. Not according to historians, right? Mm -hmm. Not one. However, what happens with hate crimes? Hate crimes you gets uh, tried in court. Like right. Person with, it's usually like one person or mm -hmm. a small group of people, like a gang, mm -hmm. that gets tried in court mm -hmm. in the same case. Right, and in all of the southern states, for the most part, between 1865, when Civil War ended, to the 1940s, the, most of those jurisdictions had uh, codes within their, their criminal law to prosecute hate crimes, okay? But lynching was something that was not prosecuted, right? Even though lynching was supposedly uh, motivated based on allegations of criminality within the black population, right? So that's the basic, that's the basic point there that I'd like you to, to uh, illustrate. Yes, Lenore? Yeah, I have a What is a hate crime? It's, it's pretty much the same as today. Who hasn't spoken <coughs> today? Is it Tasha? No. Tundra. <laughs> what's what's a hate crime? A hate crime is basically when you commit an offense against someone that you personally or like believe you either hate 
believe that. Like, I don't understand this. A white person might go ask you on a black person because they're racist and they don't like black people. Right. So there are certain protected classes uh, within American society, which due to history of discrimination are, are now protected. Whereby if you committed a certain crime directed at them, there, was, there are slightly higher penalties, right? Those are hate crimes. She, she just talked about hate crime based on, on color, on race. But there are hate crimes today based on sexual orientation. What else? Age. Sorry? Age. Age. Uh, I'm not sure that seniority is, is a, a protective class, but you're probably right, OK? <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. There's, there's something else I, I have in mind. Gender. Gender, OK. Religion. Religion. These are all protected classes. I think even um, there's one more. Um, can you help me, Tony? Um, age, yeah. Maybe not directly, but I think uh, uh, what's it happens when you're injured and disability, uh, disability uh, is a protected uh, class. It's definitely in New York State, if not on the federal level as well. So these are all different uh, kinds of hate crimes, right? And hate crimes are, are supposed to be prosecuted, even if they are not prosecuted to the extent that they should be, right? We now have uh, President Trump uh, in, you know, running the justice system. He has his own uh, attorney generals or who might not prosecute, who might not prosecute these crimes as much, right? Or who might not uh, place as a priority the protection of certain classes, right? Right? Okay, next, Rakibo, what's the next bullet point? Uh, explain why lynching was a particularly effective tool in subjugating black society in the South even after the Civil War, 1865 and forth. Okay, now read that same question again a bit louder so we can all hear. Okay. It's a long question. <clears throat> explain why lynching was a particularly effective tool in subjugating black society in the South even after the Civil War, 1865 and forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, David? Yeah, um, well, one reason was um, there was no no law there to enforce um, the civil, um, you know, the Civil Rights Act. So people were supposed to be free, but you were being pulled out of courthouses or you know out of jails, being accused of something that you didn't do, mm -hmm. and being murdered, and you know. There was nobody there to, to, to take up for you. There was no law. So, mm -hmm. of course, that's one of the, 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 the reasons why it was an effective tool because who are you going to run to? And you don't have the, the means to defend yourself mm -hmm. or stuff like that. So Absolutely. And, and Lanoi, what does that create in society when you are, sub you are subject to be pulled uh, out and... and, and uh, charged or just accused of a crime and killed for it. Well, what would that happen to you? Speak up. I was saying that it seems so fair in It instills real fear, right? It instills a, a constant state of fear in the black society, right? That at any moment, for any social transgressions, right? Just for stepping in the way, for not yielding, on a footpath so that a white person could cross you, or for, in some cases, uh, being a little too loud when white women are in the area, you know? Or just any accusations. You could be, you could be lynched and killed, right? And so it's not just the person that would be lynched that needs to worry. It's the, the families <laughs> that will lose somebody, a breadwinner, or even a child, or or uh, the woman of the house just because of, a, of an accusation which does not need to be credible, right? That causes uh, your society to be in a constant state of fear. And it's effective in driving that point about racial subordination of your, your population because, because you, you, you know your place. You know, you know your place is beneath, right? Beneath those of the white. So just better be hyper vigilant at all times.
to avoid uh, becoming lynched, right? Yes, my. Also, in those psychological uh, effects, such as anxiety and constant paranoia. It it definitely does, and we're just about to you know, one step ahead of us. <laughs> we're about to move towards a post-traumatic slave syndrome. That absolutely, definitely. What's one of the What's the biggest killer in New York's, well, in the country? What's the biggest reason that most people die prematurely in American society? Heart disease, right? Are you a doctor? That's <laughs> <laughs> correct. Heart disease, you know, uh, all kinds of, of heart disease related complications, right? right? Uh, diabetes, high blood pressure. That's the main reason people die. And, and what's the main reason? What is one factor for that that causes that? Yeah. Stress. I, I think I. Will you say stress? It's okay. Stress. I know you were going to go to that. No. Maya. What were you about to say? I was going to say. Some of us have family members who have it, and the trait was passed down. It's 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 definitely hereditary as well, right? <laughs> but stress, stress is that one of the biggest factors causing or leading to heart disease, right? If you can limit stress in your life, you are expected to live a much more a longer life, right? A healthier life, even at that. So yes, definitely. Uh, ages and ages or generations upon generations suffering from slavery and then Jim Crow and then now the Jim, new Jim Crow or mass incarceration as we will cover in, in later weeks can be expected or should be expected to have some, some uh, impact, some, some <coughs> visible health impacts, right? In, in society, in black societies at least, or affected societies, okay? So let's just quickly read the last bullet point before we go get to, to post-traumatic slave syndrome. Mohammed, please. Our white privilege is, in some ways, the more severe obstacle to black freedom than the institution of slavery was. Okay, I'm asking you to read it again because we need to hear it and take Our note. Our white supremacy is, mm -hmm. in some ways, a more severe obstacle to black freedom than the institution of slavery was. You're right. So why is white supremacy in many ways a bigger obstacle to uh, black freedom than slavery was or lynching in specific was? Mm -hmm. How is white supremacy in some ways a more severe obstacle to black freedom than the institution of slavery was? And you said I want to ask somebody else, okay? Peter. Keep thinking on that. Yeah. Keep thinking on that. Okay, uh, Khaled, your hand was up first. Because with slavery, you, there was ways to, to beat it, like you could run away, or like it, slave, slavery had it end, or white supremacy. It's so embedded in society that it controls every aspect of our lives, like like with Jim Crow, mass incarceration, um, the three crimes law, the drug act, Clayton and Nixon. So I feel like with white supremacy, there's no way that it's, we feel like it's ever gonna end, it's always mm -hmm. gonna be around. Absolutely. Um, you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say, yeah, that it, it's kind of more or less something that's like psychological. It's not mm -hmm. something that's like a physical, you know what I mean? It's not that something that you can see. Yeah, exactly. You can see slavery, right? You can see families enslaved, right? In an enslaved family back in, in those times, separation of family was a real, it was a real, um, it was a reality. Uh, in fact, that was probably one of the, the most resent, resented aspects of slavery, as was practiced, chattel slavery was your child, which was a couple of months old as a black family, um, had a certain value of money put on it and will be taken if the if the uh, the owner wanted to 
settle some kind of a a loan, a, a debt, or just to to make some money, or or to punish the family. This these were the real experiences of enslaved families. So you see that, and the abolition of slavery in eighteen well, the emancipation in 1863, which, which should have ended slavery right then, even before 1865, um, was a time, a specific time period, after which point you were, they weren't supposed to be slaves, right? So there is a start and stop point, at least still 1865. Let's say 1865. Slavery has ended with the, with the South losing, the Confederates losing the Civil War. White supremacy is a whole different beast, right? Because this is, you feel it more than you see it. There are all kinds of biases and racism that has been built into the state apparatus itself, into state administration, into policies, which are designed to keep or to, to uh, favor white families of fairer skinned people. That's something that's a, a much more harder uh, concept to, to address and, and to beat. You, you better have a, a certain willingness politically to go after those kinds of notions. Otherwise, it's going to take a long time to address something like, like uh, redlining, right? Where banks specifically don't give loans to, to uh, certain people <laughs> uh, as they walk into that uh, door, even though they have the same number of assets as a white family that just walked out with the loan, right? That's happening today, yeah? Right? Mm -hmm. the, those are institutions of, those are vestiges of white supremacy that still survive to today. Shoot, Maya was talk, talking about police brutality. Police brutality is informed long, long, long ago uh, by the institution of, uh, of convict leasing. We covered that, right? Convict leasing was a way to enforce racial domination, especially the economic incentives that were <laughs> the bedrock of, of slavery, uh, to newly freed blacks, right? You could be picked up and put to work uh, in a prison, loaned out to different industries, that profited off your labor, right? So white supremacy is a concept which has far-reaching uh, implications in all aspects of society, which is difficult to address. There, there are all kinds of, yes, uh, laws that you can pass to try and address that, but it's, it's a difficult notion, and America's still struggling with that.